and a Canadian like this. And we are claiming those promises now, and on the strength of them go forward assured that thy word is going to produce its results in the lives of men and for thy glory and praise. For we ask it in Jesus' name, who promised it all. Amen. I would like to have you take your Bibles and turn with me to the 5th chapter of the Gospel according to John and the 28th verse. The 5th chapter of the Gospel according to John. Our subject, as it was announced, is the first resurrection and the second death. Because of the limitation of time, I may not be able to get into the second death, but we'll try at least to cover the subject of the first resurrection. John chapter 5 and verse 28, we read the words of our Lord Jesus. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Now that we did not have anything else in the entire Bible, but these two verses from the list of our Lord Jesus Christ, it would be sufficient to establish three definite facts. The first fact is there is going to be a resurrection. That is plainly stated by our Lord. Second thing that our Lord states is that it is going to be a universal resurrection. That it will include all mankind. For he says the hour is coming when all that are in the grave shall come forth. And the third fact which is established is that it will be a bodily resurrection. For our Lord specifically says that they that are in the grave shall come forth. And we know that when a person dies, both the faith and the unfaith, that the body is returned to the ground and it is incarcerated in the grave. So it will be a bodily resurrection. And the third fact is that there will be two kinds of resurrection, as well as two classes in the resurrection. Those that shall be raised unto eternal life and those unto eternal damnation. So I'd like to have you just remember that in this very brief passage of Scripture, our Lord establishes these four cardinal facts concerning the future resurrection. Let me repeat them so you may remember them. There will be a resurrection. It will include all men who have done it. It will be a bodily resurrection and it will include both the damned as well as the saved. Now in this passage there's no mention made of any difference of time between the resurrection of the just and the resurrection of the unjust. It is merely suggested that there are two classes and we can read into it that there may be a difference and element of time between them. Now if you'll turn to the 14th chapter of the Gospel according to Luke, we have just a little bit of further light and further information. The 14th chapter of the Gospel according to Luke, I begin reading in the 13th verse, and noting very carefully, But when thou makest a feast, call for the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Now I want you to notice that our Lord here sets apart the resurrection of the just as being distinct by implication from the resurrection of the unjust. There would be no point, no purpose, in saying the resurrection of the just, if the unjust were resurrected at the same time. It would be ambiguous. All he needs to say is, Thou shalt be resurrected, or thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection, period. But the fact that he adds 
at the resurrection of the just immediately suggests that there is a distinction, a difference between the two, of the just and of the unjust. Now we'll turn to the classic passage on which we preached last Saturday night, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we have an advanced revelation. We have something else here which I think will cast a little bit more light on it. The first chapter of Revelation of uh, 1 Thessalonians and verse 16. Now notice it carefully. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now I'd like to add you know the expression, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now I think that all of you will agree with me that the fact that Jesus singled out the dead in Christ as rising first, he implies beyond a question of doubt that the dead out of Christ will rise last, or at least at some subsequent period. Now I know that our post millennial brethren have another explanation for it, and they say that the expression dead in Christ refers to the relationship of time between the dead being resurrected and living believers being changed. Now that may all be true, but if there is only one resurrection, and both the unjust and the just, the saved and the lost, are all resurrected at the same time, and then the living ones are changed, there would still be no point in saying the dead in Christ. It would be a saving of words to just simply say, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead shall rise first. That would be all that was necessary. But our Lord is very, very careful to say the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now up until this point, we have had nothing to do with the unsaved. Every one of these references that I have quoted for you has to do with believers. Has to do with believers. They're merely mentioned in John 5, 28, the resurrection of damnation. But in 1 Thessalonians 4 and in Luke 14, Jesus is talking about a group of believers that will be resurrected at a special time prior to the resurrection of those that are not included in that particular class. So that we have here a very definite suggestion that there is a period of time which will elapse long or short, makes no difference whether five minutes or a thousand years, makes no difference. There is the suggestion that there is a space of time between the first and the second resurrection. Now if you'll turn to 1 Corinthians 15, I want you to notice something very, very striking. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, as you all know, is the great resurrection chapter. But I want to emphasize one thing before we go from it, and that is this, that 1 Corinthians 15 has nothing to do with a spiritual resurrection. The entire chapter, from beginning to end, deals with a bodily resurrection of men and women who have gone. First, it takes up the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ as the first fruits from the dead and from the grave. Then he takes up the resurrection of believers, and then incidentally mentions the resurrection of unbelievers and those that are lost. So you can't get out of the teaching of 1 Corinthians 15 by trying to spiritualize it and say that it's talking about salvation. It's talking about the redemption of our spirit, the resurrection of a new life within us with faith in Christ. In this chapter, he's talking about the bodily resurrection. And he says in the 20th verse, now note it, But now is Christ risen from the dead. He has proven 
the following literal resurrection of Christ by many witnesses and has established the fact that Christ came from the grave in a resurrection glorified to be your spiritual resurrection body. And on the basis of that resurrection, we are assured of our bodily resurrection. And so I read in verse 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the first fruit of them that slept. For since by man came death, Adam, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Now look at the next verse, so much misunderstood. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now that sounds like universal salvation, doesn't it? That sounds like ultimate restoration. And yet I think if we just change one word legitimately, you'll find out what he means. For as through Adam, that is through Adam's sin, all men die, so through the resurrection of Christ, all men shall be made bodily alive. Change and walk. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ bodily is the basis of the resurrection of anybody else. If he has not arisen, then there is no resurrection from the dead. And so the faith, faith the damned, the lost, benefit by the resurrection, you can call it a benefit, to be raised unto damnation, but they benefit by the resurrection of Christ in this that they too shall be bodily raised because Christ was the first fruit from the dead. Now, of course, to the difference as we shall see. But all physical resurrection rests upon the fact that Christ arose from the dead. Now, having said that, that all men shall arise, say and walk in harmony with what Jesus said in John 5, 28. He says in the 23rd verse, and he starts with a book. But every man in his own order, although all will be raised, there is a tremendous difference, an eternal infinite difference between the various groups in this resurrection. And so he says, but every man in his own order. Now those of you that know a little bit about the word recognize the fact that the word order here is a, a, a sort of a military term and can be translated as company or a regiment. And what Paul is saying is that in the resurrection of all men, there will be various groups, various companies, by themselves, in which all will be fitted somewhere, and these will follow a definite order, just as an army marching along, uh, one division and another division and a third division, and a fourth division coming by in review. So he says, but every man in his own company, in his own order. And then he gives three companies. I'd like to have you see those. Christ, the first two. Christ, the first group. Now, in order to understand that, we have to go back to the economy of Israel. When Israel gathered the first uh, few ripe years of the early harvest, the uh, devout uh, Jew would take a handful of ears, E-A-R-S. Not one ear, but a handful of ears. And he would bring it to the priest, and the priest would take it and wave it before the Lord as an offering, a wave offering, and present it as the earnest and the promise of the coming harvest. By that act of offering the first fruit, he was dedicating the entire harvest and promising the entire harvest to be brought in. Now, Christ, in fulfillment of these feasts in the 23rd of the day, became the first fruit of them that slept in the plural, in the plural. Remember the first was the Passover, the cross. Then we had the unleavened bread, which is, I think, it's burial and the carrying away of our sins. And then the first fruit 
of his resurrection. Now when Jesus arose from the tomb, he was the first one to arise and to remain in that glorified state. He did not arise alone. But with him were a great many, a handful of Old Testament uh, saints of God of the died, who came forth out of their graves on the morning of Jesus' resurrection and were seen on the street of Jerusalem and we presumably believe were caught up in their resurrection bodies with the Lord Jesus Christ in the heaven where they are today as the first fruit of Christ, as the earnest of the coming harvest of the resurrection. we we'll find the record in Matthew 27. Look it up when you get home. When Jesus died and said, in his city, he gave up the ghost. There was an earthquake, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of them that Bodies, bodies, bodily resurrection. Many bodies of men that slept, they must have been Old Testament saints, arose and came out of their graves after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and were seen upon the streets of Jerusalem and evidently caught up. So there is in heaven a first group company of saints, not all of them, but a earnest, a token, a down payment to assure us of the coming heart. Now that's the first company. Now look at your verse again. 24 verse of 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 23 verse. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruit. What is the next word? Oh, come on, all of you, wake up. Afterward. Now that implies it wasn't at the same time, doesn't it? So here we have a period of time. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. There's our second company. The first company had already 1,900 years ago. See, time doesn't mean too much for the Lord. He's the eternal one. And now we are waiting for the harm. Afterwards, they that are Christ at his coming. And we know that, of course, in First Thessalonians chapter 4, Lord himself is sent to heaven and shall the voice of the archangel from God, and then Christ shall rise first. And we shall rise and remain unto his coming shall, because we got First Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, and we shall all change the moment between the night of all the rest. That's the heart. That's the heart. Now then, we've got, we've got the first fruit in, and we've got the harvest in. And if we have time, we'll show you by and by that the gleanings trodden underfoot in the tribulation also have to be added before the harvest is complete. But now I want you to see the third company. Because here a great deal of misunderstanding has resulted. Yet I can't understand why. Now then, I read again in the 23rd verse, but every man in his own order, Christ the first group, afterward they that are Christ at his coming, then he promised the end. Now the literal translation is, then the last one, then the end one, then the terminal one. Now who are these last ones? Who are the terminal ones? That after the rapture of the church, after the resurrection of the believers, uh, are going to be raised. Very simple as we read the rest of the verse, and if I can go slow, I'll go slow so you can get it. After then cometh the end, when, now get that word, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Then come the last one, when, when Christ shall have finished his kingdom reign, when he shall have subjected all things under his feet, when time is going to cease and eternity will be ushered in, then will be 
another resurrection. After the reign of Christ, after the kingdom, hey, now you study that and you look at it and you can't give any other interpretation to it. Then come the last one, when he shall have finished, completed the kingdom, when he shall have ended his reign, then those who are not raised, either in the first group or in the harvest, or in the gleanings, shall be raised unto eternal death and everlasting ignominy. Now, up until now, we have established that the first resurrection will be by itself, and that is here in this time will enter the called the kingdom age, between that and the second death, or the resurrection of the second death. Now, then, we have reserved for us, in the last book of the Bible, the interesting information giving in the, de uh, the details. In Revelation, turn to it, and chapter 20, I read this. Fourth verse, Revelation 20. Now this is at the close of the tribulation. The tribulation is described in chapter 6, 1911. Then we have the glorious second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the wedding of the Lamb and the bride. And then I read in verse 4 of this chapter, And I saw throne, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the soul of them that were beheaded, for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their forehead, or in their hand. Now John saw the souls of those who had been beheaded, their heads cut off, for the witness of Jesus. What were they after their heads were cut off? How come? Dead. 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 Here we go to come to dead folks. They had their heads cut off. <laughs> That's what John said. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. When were they beheaded? In the tribulation. In the days of the Antichrist. Because they were beheaded, because they would not receive the mark of the beast in their hand and in their heart. Because they were faithful in that great day of testing and trial. And they evidently sealed their testimony with their heart. And they perished in the tribulation period because they would not bow to the enemies of Christ. Now then, they were dead. Are you convinced they were dead? Would you agree with me? Were they dead? <laughs> I hope I've got a good day. I want to be real dead, so there'll be no question about it. Now listen, what it says about them. It says, them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither is any, neither is received in Mark, Father, or in their hands. And they lived. What does that imply? Oh yeah, sure you all know it. Resurrection. They were dead, now they live, and reign with Christ a thousand years. So here we have the gleaning of the heart. In Israel, and after the heart was gone, read the book of Ruth, another section, they went and they picked up the stray years that had been fallen from the hands of the reapers and had been trodden under foot and crushed. And they brought those in. And then when those were brought in, then the harvest was considered to be complete. And here we have the tribulation phase, which also must be brought in uh, before we can call it the first resurrection. Now follow very carefully and notice. He says in the fifth verse, But the rest of the dead, who are they? The lost. Up until this time, nobody but faith have been raised, either in the first group, they were things. Or those that were Christ now, at his coming, uh, they're all things. And these were beheaded for the testimony of Jesus. They were things. There hasn't an unsaved person been raised yet up until this time. 
And now I read this. But the rest of the dead, I can say but the lost, live not again. Now if you try to spiritualize that, you're just showing how absolutely half the night is done you walk. <laughs> I have little patience with people that can make a bodily resurrection out of these saints that were beheaded and then turn right around and make a spiritual resurrection out of the rest. The rest of the dead who have died without Christ lives not again until the thousand years were finished. How long is a thousand years? Oh, you're, you're, you're not as dumb as I thought you were. You're ten times dumber. <laughs> How long is a thousand years? A thousand years, that's right, correct. A thousand years. Now believe it. Now, notice the last phrase. This is the first resurrection. And that's the first time the expression of first resurrection occurs in the Bible. You know why? Because the first resurrection isn't complete until the gleams, the tribulation saints, are also in on the heart. And now that they're all in, John says, this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And then a thousand years go by, this is the first resurrection, all the saints of God are in now. They are joined in Christ. They're ready to reign with him a thousand years. The rest of the dead have to wait at least another thousand years. And so we read, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Then we have the great rebellion. Then we have the battle without a shot. The fire comes down from heaven and devours the enemy. And the devil is cast into the lake of fire. And then I read in the eleventh verse. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, the unsaved, the only ones that are left dead, all the rest are alive. The only dead that are left are the unsaved dead. And I saw the dead, small and great, the say young and old, small and great, from the poorest to the richest, from the king to the pauper, all those who have never received Christ as their Savior. He saw them stand before God. He saw the dead stand before God. That means a resurrection, doesn't it? That implies a resurrection. They were dead. Now they stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now listen, beloved, just this before, uh, before we uh, conclude, this is not a judgment of destiny. This is not a judgment of the great white throne to determine where the lost are going to spend eternity. That was settled when they died. That was settled when they died. Forever. This is a judgment that will determine the degree of their punishment in hell. Not the fact of their punishment in hell, but the degree of their punishment in the lake of fire. Because let me assure you, there's going to be an infinity of difference of suffering in hell, just like there will be a difference in reward at the judgment seat of Christ. I want to tell you that hell is going to be heaven for some people compared with what it's going to be for others. For those who've never heard the gospel, who've never had an opportunity, who've never had the chance that you had, who died without ever hearing the name of Christ or knowing about the Bible, they die in their ignorance and darkness, I'll say that it will be more tolerable for them in the day of judgment by an infinite 
infinite degree almost, almost a heaven compared to what is going to be for men and women in Peoria, Illinois, who have sat under the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, been fled with and prayed for and dealt with, and then deliberately have turned down the offer of salvation. And that is going to be the basis of this judgment, because I remind you it is according to their works. Now your things are lost according to your faith, not your works. Your relationship to Jesus Christ is determined whether you're going to spend eternity, but it's your works. The amount of life you have, the amount of opportunity you have, which will determine the place. Not only but will determine the degree of your suffering. For saying, I, if I were going to go to hell, thank God I never will, but if I did, I would want to go as a poor, benighted, even hot top, never heard the gospel, rather than go to hell in the midst of all the gospel that is being preached in this fair country of ours, with my eyes and ears open to receive the thing and then to deliberately reject it. And so this judgment will be on the basis of works. Their destiny settled by their relation to Christ. The degree of their punishment settled by their works. Now I want to say this to any of you who may be unsaved here. That if you're not going to be saved, then it would have been a lot better if you'd never heard the gospel. If you're not going to be saved, it would have been infinitely better if you hadn't come to this meeting tonight. I'll be more drastic, because I'm convinced I'm right. If you're not going to be saved, it would have been mercy if you had had a smash up on the way down here, so this meeting would never testify against you. If you're not going to be saved, it were better for you that you had never been born. I want to go on record. I may have been born 30 years too soon, but I still believe in a little hell. I cannot logically explain the mystery of Calvary without a hell. I cannot intelligently tell men what they're saved from if I can't point them to the place that Jesus described as the place of outer darkness, where the worm never dies, the fire is never quenched, where men gnaw their tongues in pain and gnash their teeth in rebellion throughout a godless, Christless eternity. All men and women, let not be carried away by the spirit of this age, which makes God a lollipop and a soothing serpent and a spineless and a sort of an individual who wouldn't punish his creatures. He's too loving to try. Oh, beloved, we need a revival of the truth of the holiness of God. And John here, in ending the book of the Revelation, ends it on his note, what else can we do? And he says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Whatever it is, a figure or reality is something terrible. And if this is only a figure, then I ask you, what is the reality then? All oh, that God might quicken us today is to believe in this book in every detail. Our Father, we pray that thou will give us the grace to believe thy word, to preach it, and not to put it into practice. In Jesus' precious name, Amen. And now I want to say just a few more things. Only take me a moment. All on the basis of this. You will notice that it says that the books were open. Give me another book somebody. And the books were open. Now there are two books. And probably more. And the one is called the book in which the works of men are recorded. And at that judgment of the great white throne where the lost 
before God and the resurrection of the damned, God will open the books and let any of these lost should put up an alibi or offer an excuse. The Lord will have the recording angel turn the page 11,786A. And there is your name. And in that book, according to the Word of God, every thought, every word, every deed has been recorded. The things you thought were forgotten, secrets that no one knew but you, committed in darkness, will be made known. And if you have any, any inclination to put up a defense, God will say, is this your record? Is this what you did on the night of May 9, 1960? My God, is that in the book? Yes. And go down the line before God, just halfway down the page, You'll say, oh, God, send me to hell. But close the book. There'll be no one. For every mouth will be stuck by the record. And the books were opened, and every man was judged according to the things written in the books according to their work. Now listen. For every sinner, on faith, there's a record of everything you've ever done since you became a responsible personality. But why is the other book brought in? This is God's double check to close every mouth. Because while this contains all the deeds and acts of the unfaith, this book contains nothing else but the name of the redeemed. That's all. Like a huge telephone director. And the unique thing about it is, if your name is in this book, <laughs> there isn't any record of you in this book. <laughs> because when he writes the name in this book, he expunges this. And your sins and your iniquities will I remember no more forever. I cast all your sins behind my back. I have blotted out of the thick cloud your transgression. And tonight I am so glad that I can come to this city and say, My name's in the book of life. And all heaven can't find a trace of my sordid record, but the sheet is clean. And so the book of life is a double check. The word says, well now, if you deny that, that this is your record, let's see if your name's in the book of life. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Do you want to stand before God on your record? Do you want that book to be open? Are you willing to take a chance to stand before Him with all the universe as a witness and have everything, every evil thought, every nasty word, every sordid act you ever committed? made public. There is nothing secret that shall not be revealed. Nothing hidden that shall not be brought to light. And no one will have any excuse at all, but will accept the punishment of eternal hell as the just desert for having rejected the offer of it. You see what I mean when they're just according to their works? It's not a matter of uh, your, your destiny, it's a matter of the degree of your punishment. And the more life you have rejected, the more responsibility you have carried, the greater will be your condemnation. And I want to repeat because
because it's so terrifically true and has so little preach that, beloved, if you're not going to be saved, it always were much better that you've never even heard. And that's why the responsibility of preaching, brother, sometimes weighs and hangs down. When you realize to stand up here and plead with men and women, and yet there are some who, because of your preaching, are going to go into a hotter hell because of it. For we are a savor of life unto life in them that are saved, and a savor of death unto death in them that are lost. And I plead with you to die man to a dying crowd settled tonight because eternity is at stake. Lord, I care not for riches, neither silver nor gold, brother saying it, but I would make sure of heaven. I would enter thy fold. In the book of salvation on his pages so fair, oh, tell me, Lord Jesus, is my name written there? Can you say with me tonight, yes, my name's written there on the page, right and fair in the book of the Lamb of God, the Lamb's book of life. My name's written there. Listen, my sinner friend, if you're here without Christ, you may have been hiding behind religion and church membership and morality and ethics and popularity and refinement and culture and a lot of other nice things that people admire. But you're like the precious soul I dealt with today with all of his religion. Didn't have the Lord Jesus Christ. And I have the privilege of showing him that Christ answers every problem. And he'll do it for you today. Would you like to have the record of your life? Now just think back for a moment. Erased, you can have it erased by letting it put your name in the list of redeemed. We won't argue about the book of life, whether they were there and it can be wiped out or whether he puts them in when you did. That's not the question. The question is this. Have you ever received the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior by a definite act of faith and have the record of your sin wiped out forever and your name found written in the book of life. I can't be any more simple, I can't be any more direct, I can't be any more plain than to ask you right now while our heads are bowed, all of us. <coughs> are you interested enough having your past blotted out. Be assured that apart from the first resurrection, you escape the second death in the lake of fire. To write in your seat, be honest with your own heart and with God. And ask yourself, do I know that I'm saved? And if you can't honestly say, yes, thank God, I know whom I have been. And I'm going to ask you now, I may never see you again down here, we're leaving in the morning. I'm going to ask you, are you willing to ask the Lord to blot out the rest? Then tell him, Lord Jesus, I want to be saved. I want my name in the book of life. Now, because tomorrow it may be too late, and a long eternity without another chance. I've heard you, God. I know my responsibility is great. I have no excuse. I have no alibi to offer. But I come now just as I am. Lord Jesus, 
save me. Will you do that? Right in your seat with your head bowed. Just in your heart say, Lord Jesus, save me. Now. And then we want to pray for you. That's what we're here for. This is more than a prophetic conference. God forbid that we should ever have meetings where we do not bear in mind that there may be precious souls that need to be saved. And if you honestly desire salvation, if you can say, Dr. Leon, I would like to know that I'm saved. I want to be saved. I want Christ to become mine tonight. I'm serious about it. I mean it. I mean it enough to ask you to pray for me. Pray for me now. Then lift your hand where you are long enough so I can see it. The hand demonstrates that you are one to whom God has spoken. And you're asking us to pray for you because you want to be saved. I'm going to wait just a moment. God bless you back there, young man. While we wait and while we plead, while you see your soul deep need, while the Savior bids you come, is there another one? We've given you the word, yes, God bless you right here to my left, next to the aisle. Is there another one? You've heard the word. Now you either believe it or you don't believe it. And he that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned all <coughs> ready. Why? Because he has not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. So I'm going to wait for just one brief moment. Is there another one that will lift the hand? Well, God bless you right down here. So lift the hand high enough so I can see it and recognize it. And then put it down. You want us to close out into the darkness, probably the darkness of eternity. Oh, just 30 seconds longer may mean some soul, and I want to give you that opportunity. Anyone else, over here to my right, under this balcony here, to my right, slip up your hand and say, pray for me. In the center section here, will you just put up your hand and say, Yes, you may pray for me. I want to be saved. Or don't you want to be saved? If you don't want to be saved, keep your hand down. Don't raise it. Don't be a hypocrite. Be honest. But if you really want to be saved, I'm asking you now. Show it. The hand doesn't save you. It's trust in Christ. But the proof will be that you're not ashamed to own him. Is there one over to my left under the balcony here? One over there? Yes, God bless you. Over there. Up in the balcony. Last call now. Anyone up there? Would you like to lift your hand high? Now while our heads are bowed, <coughs> I'm going to ask Pastor uh, Dunn to step down and I'll be with him in a minute. I want some personal workers to come forward. I'm going to ask those of you, the four, I think the five, who have raised their hands. A demonstration of the reality of your profession. If you're ashamed of it, we have a right to doubt it. I want you to get rough up out of your seat where you are. Walk down here to the front. Shake Pastor John's hand. Go into the prayer room. And let's get acquainted with you and help you. Now those of you that raise your hand, will you do that? We're not asking you to, uh, to join the church. We're asking you only to come with one of the workers and seal this thing for good. Now I'm going to wait just a moment while the Christians pray. Who will be the first one to come? God bless you, will be the next one. This young lad over here, I believe, are you willing to come? Come right along. Young man way in the back there. God bless you, that's the stuff. The Lord will own that. Is there another one? God bless you, young man. We're not trying to force this down your throat, we're trying to help you. Coming forward won't save you, but it will give you courage. And I know we can give you assurance. And these people are here to pray for you. And to help you. Now just one last call. Then we're going to sing just the first of a hymn while we stand. And be dismissed.
Would you like to join this company that has come? Whether you've raised your hand or not, you're among friends. There's no strange side to this. There's no catch to it. We want you to get right with God tonight. And then if we can help you to find a church home, we'll be most happy to do so. And instruct you. And help you. Now, is there anyone here that says, I have accepted Christ, but I've never publicly confessed it? Anyone like that? I want you to just step up and come on down. Our Father, now as we come to the close of this service, and as we sing one of these precious hymns of the church, we pray that thou wilt defeat the designs of the enemy and grant that men and women tonight, realizing they are tottering on the very brink of eternity, will yield, receive the Lord Jesus Christ and be willing to gain the victory by confessing him with their mouth. Pray for those that have gone in the prayer room, for the personal workers that are now dealing and praying with them. Thank you for the blessing of this conference. Pray that I'll be with those who have come from a distance and give them traveling mercies and continue to bless in the most unusual way. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll rise and sing one verse out. Just as I am without one plea, you'll be the pretty brother. Why is there? 198. Is anyone else? Come on down before we descend.